Alrighty, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU is also the parent company of Michigan Virtual School, a supplemental state-sponsored virtual school, Michigan LearnPort, an online professional development portal for K-12 educators and personnel, and MyBlend, a blended learning initiative providing K-12 schools with resources, products and services to personalize learning options for their students and improve student achievement. Before we begin today, just a quick disclaimer. This webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during the webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information, which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI, unless otherwise specified. I'll take a quick moment now to introduce the presenters that we have in attendance with us today. Um, we are actually showcasing a chapter that they have written for us, um, or not for us, but for the Handbook of Research on Blended and Online Learning, K-12 Blended and Online Learning. And today we'll be joined by Randy Labonte and W. Ian O'Byrne. Randy Labonte has been a senior level executive for over 30 years in the education sector, works and teaches online. His doctoral research led him to take on the role of lead consultant and researcher for seven years at the BC Ministry of Education and was on a team that researched distance education for the Alberta government. He was central in development of policy, agreements, and e-learning standards, as well as led the design and implementation of the quality review process for BC online K-12 schools. He presently teaches online courses for Vancouver Island University and recently took on the role of acting chief executive officer for the Canadian e-learning network while continuing his other contract work. W. Ian O'Byrne is an assistant professor for educational technologies at the University of New Haven. Ian is the coordinator of the Instructional Technology and Digital Media Literacy Program at the University of New Haven. He is also currently a member of AERA, IRA, and LRA NCTE. He currently serves on the policy and legislative committees as well as the Area 10 co-chair and e-editor for LRA. He also serves on the Literacy, E-Learning, Communication, and Culture Committee for IRA. He is the current department editor for Multiliteracies, Production and Consumption for the Journal of Adult and Adolescent Literacy. His research examines the literacy practices of individuals as they read, write, and communicate in online spaces. With that, I will hand it over to our presenters. So I'm not sure, Ian, whether you want to jump in first or whether I will do that, so. Um, no, Randy, you go right ahead. Uh, it's, it, yeah, let's fix your video there, Randy. Let's see what you look like. Is that popping up for everyone? Is that popping up all right? I get a little uh, notes that better performance or reduced bandwidth switched to add in while sharing camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, it's good to see everybody there. We've got a packed house. Um, it's really excited to talk about open learning right now. Um, as Justin mentioned earlier, this is a, um, and we'll share a ton of links in the uh, chat. This is part of a chapter that we put together. We also have a piece that we put together in JAL, um, and we'll have a ton of links to share, and hopefully this is the start of the discussion. Um, you know, so as we come up with ideas, please keep in touch. But Randy, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Ian, as well. And Lee sends her regrets. Uh, she's uh, dealing with uh, personal issues, and Verena is also uh, <laughs> another personal issue that came up. But Verena's going to probably jump in later for us, and Colin was not available. So, um, yeah, so I want to make this probably as, as interactive as possibly we can, uh, interactive as we can possibly make it. So, um, first off, is that I'd like to sort of get a sense of who's who in the zoo. Uh, if you don't mind, and uh, just let us know. I think now Danielle is in Kenya, so just maybe text in there a little bit about where you're at, um, not where you'd like to visit, Stephanie, but uh, and while you're just texting where you're 
at and sort of a little bit in terms of um, whether you're uh, research or in post-secondary or in uh, non-profit organizations, etc. Just to let us know who's who in the zoo. And, and uh, Jason, I was just texting with Michael Barber and Skype, and he says to say hi. I did uh, ask him if he was available. No, he's got uh, meetings that he's in caught in there. And yes, Catherine, thank you um, for that intro. And just for the sake of it as well, because I got the mic, is that I'm uh, just north of Victoria, Canada, on uh, Vancouver Island and uh, having a, a wonderful, very hot, dry summer in drought conditions. So uh, as much as the south is hot, uh, some of the areas here are, are on fire and still very hot. Africa Virtual University, Daniel, thank you. That's great. And in Orlando, Laurie, OK. And Laurie, uh, Steve uh, and Junio. So I know Steve Shetler and new Wayne Poncia, who's moved on to another organization uh, from Junio. So welcome. And Kristen, uh, researcher, excellent, OK. Um, and uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> first year doc at Georgia State. Okay, um, high school. Stephanie um, Loomis teacher. is in oh. the house. <laughs> yeah, and Ian, if you just want to keep your mic open, you can talk with me and over me. I'm I'm quite happy for all that. That's no. I think we can great. dance well together. Okay, so we got some teachers, we got some researchers. So excellent. So uh, a little bit about open learning, and I just sort of uh, let you soak in a little bit. I'm going to ask you some questions about what you think about open learning, but I want to start off with a little bit of a context. Uh, and it's not necessarily context about the book chapter or anything else, but just context in education. Um, is that there's a lot of jargon and there's a lot of rhetoric that flows around. So when you say the word MOOC to uh, a group of people in a room, uh, they'll conjure up different images, they'll have predisposed perceptions and prejudices, uh, but also assumptions uh, when you use that term, like anything else. When you say open learning, it can mean a whole variety of different things. And as we know in research, it's a paramount importance to ensure that we actually uh, define clearly what it is that we mean by terms that we're using. And that's the value of research, but in practical and practitioner worlds, uh, sometimes it can mean a lot of different things, and we're not, uh, it's just a caveat about that. The other thing that in terms of context, as we all well know, is the nature of community has changed rapidly in education, and now uh, the whole personal learning environment and Twitter world that educators, uh, many educators have embraced, has really changed the whole professional learning uh, approach and nature. Uh, but it's also up and opened a, a numerous new channels uh, and opportunities for communication, dialogue, and networking, um, including the you know the Siemens net, uh, connectivist kind of approach. But more importantly, there's there's a whole plethora of people. I mean, I don't know whether you, in K to 12 space you follow EdWebNet, but EdWeb.net will attract at webinars sometimes close to 600 educators and teachers, and they draw from a pool of teachers talking to teachers. And that's just one of the unidirectional pieces. They've also got online communities that are well uh, served and well received as well. And then there's the whole social media aspect. So when we talk about open learning, it's in a context which is different from certainly the, the context that I taught in when I was in the K-12 system. And really, the value in open learning to me, as well as uh, to our fellow authors, uh, was in the ability to enable educators, students to learn from with to learn with and from each other. So it's a co-creation, it's a constructivist kind of context that is evolving with, within here. Uh, and that's, I think, an important part when we start to put a lens on open learning and unpacking that to a certain extent. So um, Ian's got, well, there's a good uh, definition, I think, that we put in the book as well that I'm just going to copy and paste this in right now in the text chat area. Um, and while you're pacing that, part of the challenge here and part of the beauty of this book, um, you know, is that uh, it's a lot of fun writing, you know, a, a lit review and studying a field that's constantly in motion. Um, you know, my, my advisor, Don Liu at UConn, uh, made a lot of hay by saying that, you know, new literacy and literacy is didactic, meaning that it's changing all the time. So what you'll see as we talk about open learning and OER and everything else is that, you know, in, in some of these situations, there's not a lot out there. And, and Catherine and Rick were gracious enough to tell us, you know, we know that there's not a lot out there, but we have to put a stake in the ground now and figure out 
where should we head? Um, so there's not a lot out there, but things are changing all the time. And there's also some challenges that we have, you know, opportunities, but also challenges in making this happen in our classroom. So a lot of this is basically putting a stake in the ground and figure out, okay, where should we head and what, what possibilities are out there for us? Great, thanks Ian. And, and you know, open learning is really a lot about open, accessible, free to use, but most importantly, repurpose. I think that's the other part of it. Uh, so it's in that whole OER, Creative Commons license field, but it's also, as Canol says, it's more than that. It's, it's about um, the, the Moodle communities that evolve and the Moodle hubs that we've seen in different areas and places that have evolved. Um, it's about approaches. It's about scholarship. It's about open publications. It's about open technology as well. Um, and Tony Bates probably says it best. It's, it's just about removal of barriers. So it's not about trying to define what it is. It's about saying, uh, removing any barriers for that communication connection, the ability to learn, uh, both for certainly professionals and, and teachers as well as with students. Um, and it's interesting, and I think maybe Ian, maybe you can address this about the history of open learning in the Montessori. Uh, well, we're trying to find, it, it was fun trying to track back and figure out exactly when did all this start. Um, you know, we're trying to look at different learning movements and figure out, um, you know, when exactly does open have its, you know, beginning or opening. Um, I don't know where, where was the, how, what was the link to the Montessori piece? Well, it was, it was, um, I'm not sure who traced it back. Maybe it was Colin that traced it back and, and created an argument that said the authors that wrote a lot about Montessori and the, the development of the movement about student choice and learning through experience um, was where open, and I think it situates in the context of the, the sort of the constructivist view about learning that we're in a network of nodes of content and people and it's in that network that we find the opportunity to learn through experience and choices. So who we choose to interact with in the online communities, who we, what content we choose to interact with. So in this world that's highly networked and digital, uh, students have a lot more freedom and choice, whether they're provided and structured in K-12 or not. They do have those opportunities and there's a plethora of mobile access that is utilized by students, certainly in a K-12 system. Um, but also beyond. So it, it's an interesting parallel. I'm not sure if anyone here would say that open learning and Montessori methodologies and approaches would have some degree of, of, uh, of a connection. I don't know. And anyone else in here want to speak to that? I'm going to get off the mic and I'm not sure, Justin, whether we've got mics for our participants. I think there is, yeah, the, it, so if you, if there's anybody out there that wants to speak to the, the Montessori movement or possible connections between open, I think you can raise your hand digitally and then Justin can turn your mic on. Oh, Stephanie, go for it. Got it. We That's Stephanie. Here, just fine. Oh yeah, there you are. Oh, here I are. Okay, so I um I taught in a Montessori preschool uh, 20 years ago, and um, I really liked the methods, and it makes sense to me to connect that Montessori methodology to open learning because it really is completely student led by student interest. And so when I was working there as a music teacher. Um, some of the kids were really into it, some of the kids weren't. But I had never really put those two things together until you mentioned that and all the things are going off in my brain, all the neurons are firing. Because there is something there that goes back all those years that's very relevant with the technology we have now. So we can actually extend those, those principles into as much education as we want to, whatever level it is. Thanks for, for sharing that, uh, Stephanie, and I think it provides a little bit of background in terms of uh, where that is. And, you know, it's, it's an old story. In education, there really isn't anything that's new that hasn't already been talked about. It's just a, a rejigging of it in a new context uh, that's there. So the, the parallel to Montessori um, learning and 
approaches is interesting because is open learning defined that way? Well, not necessarily, but in its actual practice, it is not unlike uh, that kind of an open kind of self-designed uh, approach. So any other thoughts on just in terms of background about open learning, what it is, what it might mean before we move on to start talking about uh, Ian will pick up on OERs. So before we do that, I forgot I was supposed to ask you because I scrolled down in my Word, uh, my Google Doc. So what does open learning mean to you before we jump in uh, for that? What is it about? How does technology play in open learning, et cetera? And we'll talk about policies and practices afterwards. But just right now, what is it, your, your top of mind thoughts about what is open learning? What does it mean to you? And is there a role for technology and how does it work? You can just text or raise your hand and grab the mic. Okay, outside of closed systems, that gets back to the Bates sort of argument about uh, no barriers to uh, to that. And I think it's interesting. There's a few comments in OERs that might uh, be of, of interest there. Multiple resources, more than one source, yes. I don't just hand a student a textbook. I actually connect them to multiple resources and I have to teach them how to be critical and analyst to ensure that what they're doing and what they're reading uh, is, is accurate. Strengths, innovation, con open content, yes, definitely. And yes, the student level of control. It's interesting, a lot of Horn and Staker's discussions around blended learning, which is not a topic in here, but which is a practice that's starting to evolve out of the classroom base, does have a, an element of student-led in here. So um, blended learning is, you know, is, is, has a connection to what open learning is doing. Uh, it's like the open textbooks, Danielle, as well, no, and tuition um, as well. And MOOCs was intended as part of that whole idea about uh, free and open learning, um, particularly for underprivileged. Uh, and student privacy comes up. So digital literacy is part of that, I think, Catherine, which is uh, what Ian will talk about as well. And yes, policy. Um, it's interesting in British Columbia, where I am, there's an initiative uh, for uh, open textbooks um, that has actually been put in policy and is now being driven in practice. Um, so there's other places where some open textbooks uh, are there. And I think Ian probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, so Grace, standardized curriculum in open environments. There is an interesting one. Uh, you've hit the nail on a real good tension. So, and multiple paths and learning community involvement and actually community involvement, et cetera. So Ian, why don't we turn it to you to maybe uh, start taking us through on OERs. Do you know how to advance or do you need me to advance? I think I can, I'm still figuring out this technology stuff. There we go. Um, so when we started talking about the chapter and we tried to make sense of the chapter, um, it was fun because we had to, you know, define our constructs and then move on from there. So we started with what is open um, and discussions between the authors about what do we mean by open. Uh, I have been moved in the past by uh, Doug Belshaw. Uh, he told me, he taught me that, you know, open is an attitude. Um, and I've blogged about that several times on my site. Um, and then from there, we move on to what exactly is open learning. Um, and so, you know, we move from open being an attitude or a frame of thought uh, to open uh, learning. And I have been pushed by, and we'll share some of the stuff from the JAL column that we put together on open learning. Uh, and a lot of my thinking and all of our thinking about that is uh, from the great people Creative Commons and uh, Cable Green and, and his work. Um, and, and so, you know, with with all of the definitions that we have for open and open possibly being an attitude and then open learning, when we move to OERs or open educational resources, what we're thinking about is these, you know, spaces or these hubs online where we share and we collect um, and we connect learners around content. Um, and so the, the challenge is that with, with OER, we're looking at uh, there, there's varying policy initiatives that allow us to create and share. Uh, there's varying 
Um, you know, we had a little bit of talk about competency-based structures and personal learning activity activities and also curriculum standards that drive the use of open. But there's, uh, with a lot of the work that we have with open learning and open educational resources, there's a, a big question about what value does this have in the classroom? Uh, should it be in the classroom? Should teachers be using this classroom? Uh, once you start to include, you know, we all love free. We, we love the term free. And, you know, I taught in inner city schools. Free was a great price point for me. Um, but the challenge is that when we talk about free, then schools and teachers and students and parents start to question, well, why are we using these free resources? Why are we using blogs in, in our classroom and teaching, you know, free teaching learning materials when we have those textbooks that are over in the corner? Um, your, tech, your classroom was probably different than mine, but when I taught eighth grade language arts, I very rarely used the literature anthology. Um, you know, I would mix in novels and different disparate pieces from the, the lit anthology, but I also built in websites and wikis and, and yes, even Wikipedia. Um, so I, I wanted my students to read uh, across different spaces. So OER basically is uh, open educational resources. These are places that we can share online content. Um, and so then what happens is that the, the questions that remain are questions about uh, value. There are questions about credibility of the resources that are out there. There are questions about um, you know, are we allowed to use these in our classroom and also are we allowed to share them? Uh, you know, as a, as a classroom teacher, can I share my, my lesson plans out online for other teachers to use or is that content that the school district owns? Um, I've gotten in a lot of um, interesting discussions with colleagues and grad students and doc students about whether or not you should be openly blogging online, whether or not you should be putting your materials out there online. Um, so the, the, the interesting point is that we're in between two uh, models right now, and I think we're trying to figure out what's the best uh, use of our time and money and focus. Um, this is a very interesting time to be having this discussion, uh, and I'll put the link over in the chat. I don't know how many people saw the petition, the open letter that's going around um, to uh, President Obama to have more money and more policy and a, and a general commitment to OER. Uh, but it's very interesting to see uh, what people are saying about it and opportunities to basically, uh, you know, force the hand of the administrators, uh, administration, at least here in the U.S., to have more money and more time spent on OERs. Um, so that's something that I, I shared out in my newsletter last week. Um, but it's something, it's interesting to take a look at the organizations that are supportive of OER and the use of OER um, and, and possibilities to have it become a real focus, at least here in the US, um, because I think from my estimation, OERs are very important and very useful outside. As, as typically happens, there are other portions of the world that are, are much uh, more quickly jumping on the use of technology, mobile, OER, open learning than we do here in the US. So a lot of links are going around. How many people use OERs? How many people add to open content? Um, how many people that are, are sitting in right now, you either actively use OERs in your classroom or you create content and you share it online uh, out for others to use with or without a Creative Commons license? And that CC licensing piece, we could have a whole entire webinar just on Creative Commons licensing. I've got a lot of content on my website to go take a look at it. Um, I think it's terribly important that we have dialogue about Creative Commons licensing and that we use it uh, and we force our students to use it, but that's a, another talk for another day. Oh, Americans are the biggest users. So content is shared. Um, Creative Commons licensing is challenging. I'm always interested by um, 
uh, Grace brings up the piece about using Creative Commons licensing for photos and videos. That's one of the challenges that, that I have. It, my blog posts are all open. Uh, my YouTube content I changed to the Creative Commons license after getting uh, uh, told to. <laughs> I'm doing air quotes by Cable Green. Uh, and, you know, it, it's always a challenge to see what content do people put out online and, and how do they license it and how do they share it. Um, and as, as Lori brings up, part of the, the, the benefit of you using an OER or, or, or lumping content together is that it makes it more uh, readily accessible by teachers and educators to be able to use it. Um, you know, I, a lot of us, uh, we spend time in the classroom hunting and foraging to go find content that, that we can share out and use in our classroom. Um, so the challenge with, with OER and, and with this licensing is, uh, and Verena, at any point, if you want to chime in, let us know. Uh, you, you've you been doing this for much longer than I have. Um, so a lot of the challenge here is that there's not a lot of opportunity for finding and accessing content, but then it's even more difficult to remix content. Um, you know, we, we want to provide opportunities for educators and students to take content and remix it online. We live in a mashup culture. We want to make it easy for uh, someone to take a great idea that you have in your classroom and tweak it a little bit for use in, you know, a different classroom, a different content area, great, a different grade level. Um, we need a better structure to, to do that. Um, the, the other challenge that we have with, with OER is, um, you know, that, that the, the licensing is a, is a big challenge when we talk about open educational resources. I shared out a link earlier to this chapter, which is open licensed, but I shared it out through academia.edu. So there's a lot of debate, we'll call it, in terms of am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to share out content in, in academia or, um, or on ResearchGate? Can I share out content on my website and my blog? Um, so these are this is some of the debate that, that's going on right now. Um, and it, it makes it problematic. Uh, I, I think that if I if I write content, you know, we spent a lot of time working on this handbook chapter. If we wrote the content and it collected dust somewhere in, in a text and it was never read or used by teachers, in my opinion, it's sort of a, a, a wasted effort. Um, we need thoughts, we need good ideas, and we need those good ideas to go out and make change in classrooms, or else I don't really see the purpose of our work. Um, but that's just my humble opinion. Um, so in terms of this continuum, we started with open. What does open mean? I mentioned earlier I see open as being an attitude that you freely share and you use. Um, I don't really believe that I have any new ideas. I think I look at other colleagues, you know, many people that are on this webinar and a lot of people online in my personal learning network, and I see ideas and one line will spur me to think of another idea. And so I think we live in this distributed economy where we all can learn from one another. Um, so if open is that attitude and open learning is the teaching and learning and the opportunity that we have to use this, this, this attitude known as open, OER is the manifestation of that that's, um, you know, providing opportunities to lump content online and be able to share them together. Then the next big question that we have is what do we mean, you know, how do we use this in our classroom? So one of the things that we talked about was open digital literacy. Um, I was a, a researcher and a grad student at UConn at the New Literacies Institute. I uh, am the current multi-literacies department editor for JAL. Um, you know, I have spent a lot of time working with Mozilla on the web literacy initiative and map. Uh, you know, many of us talk about techno literacy, we talk about digital literacies, visual literacies, uh, 21st century literacies. What we're basically getting at is, you know, if the internet is the dominant text of our de generation, how do we use that text in our classroom? You know, how do we get our students prepared to get out there and use this content? Um, and so what we tried to do is we tried to pull together some of the work that's happening 
and figure out what are challenges and opportunities in using this. Um, and so when we think about literacy practices within the, the realm of open, there's a couple challenges that are out there. One of the, the key challenges that exists in bringing this into our classroom and making this content available for our students is, is often uh, obviously an access issue. Do we have uh, the technology? Do we have the digital text and tools so that our students can use this in their classroom? Do we um, provide opportunities for teachers? Do we give teachers and educators the time to go out and find this content? to use it in the classroom? Do we give teachers, educators the latitude to go out and play, for lack of a better term, with these different texts and different pedagogical you know, opportunities to see whether or not it works with our students? Um, at least here in the US, many times that the answer is no. We don't give our educators the time. Um, the teacher evaluation system, uh, if, if state tests basically don't reflect the highest level of instruction, uh, teachers are often penalized. So one of the main issues with open and, and digital literacy practices is access and also giving teachers and students the opportunity to, to use this. Um, another challenge is, uh, and I talked about this before, is the, the idea of value and credibility and relevance. Um, so one interesting bellwether that we have is um, how many of you uh, use Wikipedia in your classroom for instruction? How many of you use Wikipedia in your classroom for instruction? How many of you uh, use it as a resource with students? Or how many of you uh, let your students as an assessment or an activity you have students edit Wikipedia in your classroom? So go ahead and leave that in the text, please. Let us know your thoughts about Wikipedia. Do you use it as a resource? Do you have students edit that? Uh, how, what is your relationship with Wikipedia? Or are you from the camp that Wikipedia is bad because anybody can write anything on it? And if somebody wants to un, unmute and uh, raise your hand to have a response about Wikipedia, uh, and you want to trash my love of Wikipedia, that's fine. Raise your hand, and Justin will let you Come on. Verena, you want to unmute and talk about Wikipedia for a minute? Oh, the, Stephanie, I love you. Yeah, it's so, the, 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 the beauty of the internet is the internet is a self-cleaning oven. And so we always have this concern that there's bad content, and there's bad info online, and there's bad open, you know, open educational resources. The internet is a self-cleaning oven. If there's garbage out there, at some point, somebody's going to find it and they'll root it out or rewrite it. Uh, that's the beauty of it. And I agree with Catherine's point. Um, I, I'm relatively educated, you know, um, and I still, uh, when I do, I'm writing a column now on, on computational thinking. I started with Wikipedia and some of the stuff is above or beyond my reading level. So it's a good starting point, but um, then I can see where do I have to go after that. Half the searches, you know, are looking for wikis. So part of the challenge in, in thinking about open literacy and, and think about open learning and open educational resources, part of the challenge is about uh, value. Um, you know, do it, how, is the information that we're looking at and using in our classroom, is it credible, is it relevant? Um, there, n no one on this webinar, but a lot of people think that just because it's printed in a textbook or just, yeah, hold on, Verena, just because it's printed in a textbook or just because it's printed online or in a newspaper, you know, it has to be true. Um, you know, we, we have this belief that it's in the textbook, so it's definitely true. And there's no lies, there's no misconceptions. <laughs> um, and, and there's also a, a, a prevailing belief, and I saw a lot of this in, in our work with online reading comprehension, there's a lot of people that have this belief set that traditional print text that's reading. 
and online reading, audiobooks, anything else, that's not reading, and it's less than reading. Um, and, and so if I have a textbook, or I have a blog post, or I have a Wikipedia page, you know, or, or I have an encyclopedia, if they still print those, the print versions are more credible, they're more valuable, they're more relevant than the online resources. We still have that tension. Um, and that's one of the things that is really affecting the way that we interact with these open resources. Farina, go ahead. You need to raise your digital hand politely when Justin sees you. Uh, what's wrong with your mic, Farina? You want to call me on a hangout and then I'll patch it through. <laughs> it won't go green. We have to recycle more. Try on the drop down menu to the right, Marina, to select your microphone and make sure that it is being read by uh, Connect. So, um, sure. So, while well, she can probably type in or we can link you in in a different way, Marina, your choice, but uh, test it out. I don't know whether there's anything that uh, Justin you can do to help out maybe with Verena. We do want her voice. <laughs> Audio <laughs> setup was it. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. Audio yes. audio conference settings. There you go. Okay, so so carry on, Ian. I'm just looking at the time and saying that we got a few discussion points that we want to get to as well. Yeah. So, I mean, basically with open digital literacy, we want to figure out what are best practices, how do we make this happen, but understand that there are challenges. Um, while we're pulling Verena in, I'm going to skip down. So, as Randy pointed out before, we have this um, incredible movement that's happening online. Uh, depending on who you talk to, this movement either already happened and it passed us by, um, and now it's spreading out. Um, and, and so what basically happens is we have a lot of these open educational resources that are online. We have open learning happening, um, you know, in, in you know, out online. And at some point, we put a stake in the ground and we said, okay, there's something new happening here. And that new thing happening here is called a massive open online classroom. And that, that has a label. We're putting a moniker on it, and we're calling it a MOOC. And so it, we, we look at a MOOC, a massive open online class, and we say, okay, this is a personal learning environment. Um, and, and this, we have an opportunity where the learner, not the teacher, or a, a, a you know, cooperation between the two, but pretty much the learner organizes their learning. So learning is self-directed, um, and the learner can um, create connections to different nodes within their network and without, uh, outside of the network. Um, the challenge is, with all the beauty that we see happening in MOOCs, um, we need to provide opportunities to, um, you know, have that take root in K-12. Um, part of the challenge that we saw in, in the handbook chapter is that with, with looking at MOOCs, we didn't spend a lot of time uh, uh, we as the field don't spend a lot of time thinking about how MOOCs can change curriculum, change credits, change what's happening in K-12 education. Um, there are several MOOCs that I have been a part of that I've, you know, helped facilitate. Um, one, to me, the best MOOC under the sun uh, is the Connected Learning MOOC, MOOC uh, the CL MOOC, is a great opportunity to, you know, polish our own skills. Um, I can't say enough about the great people with the CL MOOC. Um, that I see making a definite change um, in what's happening in the classroom. Um, and then also, in terms of MOOCs, one of the MOOCs that uh, I've helped facilitate uh, with Stephanie, who's in the room, is the uh, Walk My World project. And so we're, we're seeing a change in possibility for MOOCs to change what's happening in K-12 education. The nice thing is that um, with, you know, professional development experiences and with pre-service teacher development, um, we have a lot of challenges with 
uh, money and time. Well, MOOCs might offer us an alternative way to uh, have teachers gain the learning that they need and change what's happening in the classroom. Verena, could we grab you? Can you hear me? Yes. You don't want to know how. This is through a Google Hangout. <laughs> All I was going to say about the digital literacy piece is that I think that giving teachers or, or encouraging teachers to um, examine and learn about digital literacy skills gives them the freedom and supports their professional autonomy because then they're choosing and collecting and offering the content that best meets their students' needs, and they know what their students need. And so by denying them their digital literacy skills, then we're kind of taking away some of the control in the classroom. So it, it's about giving them those freedom and, and at the same time, giving students the digital literacy skills in order to be able to do the same thing. That was it. I think it's a great point because, you know, control, we know that power is a, a tremendous force in our classroom. We know that there's, you know, power structures. That's why we have so many issues with classroom management. You know, we and so when we give power over to students, when we give them choice, um, there is some res reticence sometimes on the far, on the form of instructors um, because are you going to get that power back? Um, so it, it it maybe a lot of this lies in you know in power dynamics in the classroom. Um, one of the last things I wanted to say about uh, MOOCs is uh, I just we just sent in a chapter on MOOCs uh, and Stephanie was part of it and in my latest thinking about MOOCs especially in K twelve is that MOOCs might provide a good opportunity for um, you know guiding educators online. Um, I, I view MOOCs as a possibility to have like a chaperoned or an escorted trip online to show teachers and educators how to access these different spaces. So if we want teachers to use Twitter, maybe you know we have a bunch of educators that know how to use Twitter and we bring you on a guided tour of the internet you know, and, and we show you all the safe spaces, and we show you where to stay away from, and within a couple of weeks, you make sure, as Verena often points out, that, it, that it's fun, you know, and it's short, and we basically give you a guided tour about what you can do online and how you can use this uh, content online. Stephanie, you want to make any points about uh, MOOCs because you spent a lot of time thinking about it recently? If you do, just raise your hand, your digital hand, please. I find that um, in all the craziness about MOOCs, what, it, what ends up coming out of them is the students are discovering for themselves and maybe rediscovering that love of learning that we miss so much when we get so caught up in as teachers or as students in whatever the rubric says the expectations are. And the MOOC gives people an opportunity to form relationships across cultures and across the international waters and um, begin to form relationships where they can actually learn. And, and interestingly, they end up learning more about themselves. So the digital identity is formed, relationships are formed, personal learning networks are expanded, and people begin to remember, oh, yes, this is why I'm still in school, or this is why I teach. And it's, it's a refreshing opportunity for people to um, renew themselves in a way that is ultimately practical and beneficial. I agree, and it's providing those opportunities, um, you know, it, it, to open up their idea, uh, their eyes, and expand their horizons. But the challenge is often whether or not teachers are allowed to do it, um, and so. 
as, as a segue, one of the challenges that we had is that policy was often a, a roadblock in, in making this happen. Randy, you want to talk about policy? Sure. Actually, what happened? That's practice. Where did policy go? I guess it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> we'll go back to practice. We're going to be having things to say. Ian, any comment on Grace's thing about digital literacy? Is it referring to functional skills or rather the larger critical rhetorical aspects? Understand That's one of the challenges that we often had was, um, you know, throughout this work, a lot of times when we talk about digital literacy, most of my work looks at, um, I can't think of a better word but now, right now, but like the higher order, you know, critical thinking, evaluation, uh, synthesis of online information. But the challenge is that we can't really get to that point if we don't bring in some of the functional skills. You know, so we would go into classrooms and we would, te we would test students about their online reading comprehension ability in, in work with uh, Clemson on the TICA grant. And that was all well and good, but we had issues moving students from the traditional PCs they use in the classroom to Macs. You know, so we'd have an online assessment and the kids would go, that's great, but how do I, how do I right click? And then our assessment would go, you know, would be, tr would be problematic. Um, so I think there is, yeah, there's, there's the logistics. Um, you know, there's carrying around all the, the, the battery packs and carrying around the, the, the USB surge protectors. There's how do I right click? There's how do I copy paste? Um, so I think a lot of times we get too far on the clouds thinking about this, and then we seem to forget um, what, um, and some of you that know me will laugh when I say this, we, we forget some of the challenges that the normal people out there have. You know, many of us, we need to never forget that we're, you know, we're all drinking the Kool-Aid now. We're in a webinar, we're all over the world, we're talking to each other virtually on the internet. I have other people in my house now that I will that I will call normals. They don't get this. They just they they're like so you're going to have a meeting now, but you're staying at the house and you're sitting in front of the computer with headphones on, and this is a meeting that you definitely have to do. Yeah, we're all we're drinking the Kool Aid now, um, and that's terribly important. But we can't forget the normals out there that they don't get it. Um, and how do we build up their skill skill level so that they can get involved in this discussion as well? And yeah, the normals, the ones with the gashes in the back of their head. Um, so <laughs> we kind of chat a little bit about a policy before, and I want to lead into maybe something for Lori as well. But uh, Jason's been a little silent. If you're around, Jason, I wouldn't mind hearing you chime in. I know because I have to report back to your former uh, boss, uh, Michael Barber, about your... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, policy is interesting. I did make the mention about public money creates it, it should be a public asset. Well, um, there's that's that's part of the educator empowerment piece, is that teachers need to be not limited. That goes back to what Bates said about open learning. It's really about removing barriers. Right now, there's a number of barriers that exist around the resourcing that goes into uh, public education as well as private education uh, and uh, for profit education. So there's some restrictions that are existing within the business models uh, and the organizational models. And that's part of the argument around an, in an open learning agenda is that you've removed those. Um, when I think in terms of, uh, you know, then a supportive policy as opposed to restrictive. So uh, when students first started accessing the internet, uh, you know, <laughs> We heard the horror stories of principals putting jammers in uh, for in, in their schools to block students from getting any outside signals through their cell phones. Highly illegal. Uh, we hear about uh, firewalls blocking access to certain things. We hear about uh, you know the sort of the net nannies uh, that uh, of the time and the era. And now we're talking more proactively and positively about open policies and open learning and digital literacies for students. So it's the same thing to me in policy. And I'd like to point to a couple of things that iNACL is really strong on in terms of uh, policy and practice driven for open learning is a policy whereby the use of public funds are creatively common licensed materials is that that becomes a political policy requirement. And I think there's an appetite for that now, and even more so to continue to move down this road of openness, and, and it, the normals start to hear more. And when I say normals, 
I think of our bureaucrats that are in the governing sections uh, of either schools, districts, or in uh, states or provinces or national uh, places. Uh, INIC also talks about repositories. So that's uh, what uh, Junio uh, Streams is about, is to try to create repositories. I know that uh, in Canada, Nelson Education is offering up something they call Geniosity, to try to create a space that's simple and easy for teachers to access and to share across. And there's an argument as well that we need to fund and support that infrastructure to enable the sharing, effective sharing. The, the one issue about uh, Creative Commons licensed is an open education resources is they may be openly licensed, but they may not be accessible. I may not have the proprietary software that allows me to get that, or I may not have a login or a user ID into the warehouse where they're stored, or it may be sealed like it is in many provinces in Canada that I can share them among Alberta or BC teachers, but do you think I can share it outside the borders? No, I can't because the jurisdiction that, that uh, supported or created the public monies to create the, those resources are, are stopping and blocking that. So I think there's a lot of implications around open learning on the directions that we're going. It's, I think it's really still very early, certainly in the policy areas. Any policies people want to share about um, that they may be actually in existence or policies that are actually hindering you in the use of open learning? Some text or raise your hand for the mic. And about uh, issues with technology and data in silos, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree, and I think it goes back to Ian's comment about normals. I think we have to really, as as the Kool-Aid makers and, and guzzlers, we have to uh, really start getting that dialogue at that level so that uh, folks begin to, to see that. Um, that's okay. Don't worry about it, your stuff. Stephanie, policies is not very well done on this slide either. <laughs> well, I missed it. <laughs> but, but, but the challenge is also, you know, tech support many times in buildings isn't really supportive. Um, you know, we don't, they don't provide educators, they, you know, I, I work with teachers that the tech support, you know, talks down to the teachers and makes them feel idiotic. Um, you know, and that's K through 12 and higher ed. Um, you know, my last institution, there was a lot of, um, you know, challenge where some of the tech support would talk down to my colleagues and I came in, they're like, oh, thank goodness, you know, we need, you can translate for us what this means. Um, I, I think there's also something that's even more problematic and nefarious is that, um, you know, when we talk about online digital identities, we know that our government and business is slurping up our data. We also know that there's a lot of money involved in uh, publishing and there's a lot of money involved in, in this information online. And so what I'm fearful of is you know, the people that don't know that this debate's happening and they don't know some of the challenges that are out there um, and that, you know, before we can have any impact, a lot of money will dictate uh, what decisions are ultimately made. Um, and that's terribly problematic. So that's where we're going to form our own country. Verena will be president and everything will be okay. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to leave this slide for people just to sort of reflect on looking at the time and want to get some time for implications of research. We have some researchers here and I think Ian has some words to say as well on that. Um, but think about policies. Are they supportive or restrictive? And is your practice really open? Are you, you openly sharing this or are there some restrictions that you may have that you're not aware of? So uh, in terms of practice as well, one of the couple of three key three key things that came out of our, our book chapter and research and that's around the uh, having authentic standards around uh, for use of open learning. So again, it's a proactive kind of policy but more proactive practices around standards that are shared openly and understood by teachers. And then connecting and promoting some co-learning collaboration sharing and theory and practices around open learning so that we, we have an informed practice, just not a rhetoric rhetoric practice about open learning. Um, and that we start to move um, all of our educators, but most importantly as well as school districts, parents, and communities, 
to protect themselves as students in online learning, that we actually start thinking about uh, that whole digital literacy, but responsibility within that. So those are sort of the three key things that we talk about with, with practice. So I'll just hesitate before I turn it over to Ian about implications for research. Not seeing anything texting, so um, why don't you go ahead, Ian, and close us off. So one of the, so uh, I'm going to skip down. Um, in terms of, you know, putting on my researcher hat, I think there's tremendous opportunities for those of us out there that want to conduct research on this. Um, I'm a believer that classroom teachers should be researching what's happening. Uh, that's why I decided ultimately to leave my classroom, um, is that I had a lot of questions about teaching and learning on the internet, um, and I, I wanted to make a difference, and the more questions that I asked, the, the less I uh, received answers that I thought were acceptable. Um, and that's not saying that you need to go out and go get yourself a PhD to do this, okay? Um, you can research in your own classroom, you can start up a blog, you can create your own voice, technology is changing, all that. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities. If you're using OER in your classroom, if you have questions about OER, um, blog about it. Start up a blog and Openly reflect about what you're doing. Test out the use of OER. How do you uh, attach yourself to it? What use do you find? How do your students interact? What happens when the principal comes by and goes, wait a minute, these kids are just reading Wikipedia? Um, you know, what do parents say? So as you adopt and use OER, blog about it. We need to know what you're doing and share it out there on Twitter using the hashtags. Um, talk to the Mich Mich Michigan, Michigan Virtual Learning Institute. I'm sure they would love to feature your work. Um, think about different open learning environments and how you can be flexible. How can you have your students think in different ways and use text in different ways? And for heaven's sakes, remix content that's out there. Um, think about your own role. Think about the role of the instructor as you teach openly online. Um, we talked a lot about whether or not you're allowed to do this. Think about how this might happen. Um, and then as we've talked a lot about in the chat, what are these digital literacies that we need as our students use these environments? Um, we've ignored all the classroom management issues that happen when you turn on the internet and let your kids go open and wild. We've ignored um, acceptable use policies in our schools. Were your acceptable use policies written, you know, 25 years ago and, you know, they no longer have any bearing on what really is happening, you know, online or face-to-face or -face in your classroom? Um, we really haven't talked about um, terms of use or terms of service. You know, are your students allowed to use some of these tools? Um, I've been doing a lot with Hypothesis um, after leaving Genius. You know, with Hypothesis, are your kids allowed to use it, you know, depending on their age? Um, so we haven't talked about any of that stuff. And this is stuff that we have to talk about. And you're in the classrooms, you're on the front lines, you should be leading this debate. So uh, questions that we have um, in the room, does anybody have questions they want to voice, things they want to ask uh, as we're wrapping up? You can either raise your digital hand and Justin will let you uh, Unmute. Uh, you can put a question in there, but what do you think? And as we're banging away in the keys and as we're unmuting, please keep in mind that these this should be the beginning of the discussion. Um, you know, we'll all send this out online. We'll blog about it. These materials are out there living on the internet someplace. Yeah, Catherine, that's one of the challenges that I saw. Um, at my old university, I did not like the learning management system. I am uh, Blackboard averse. Um, I I get I get hives when I mess around with Blackboard, so I use my own. I develop my own tools. I'm a Google Apps for learning person, um, and I like making my own spaces. I hate Blackboard, um, and so now I'm going into a new institution, and I. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I'll have to, you know, hopefully stay under the radar for a while while I play around. Yeah, Grace, one of the things I want to change, I want to test out is Canvas. Um, I've also been experimenting a little bit with Fedora and Udacity to see could I put stuff there. Um, but it's that's part of the challenge. You know, building your own LMS is awesome, but then when kids start class and you um, tell them the first night is, hey, here's a syllabus, and also, 
here's an hour and a half on how you add yourself to my LMS. That's challenging. And Modo is a great tool too. Oh, Farina's got all of it. All right. I, I, I want to know uh, how to run uh, Canvas. I will try out Haiku. As we're typing away, anybody want to unmute and uh, ask questions? And I just want to jump in on the LMS thing is that I think you're trapped in no matter which way you go, even Canvas has its structure. Uh, but the LMS is really about the, the, uh, the organization of school and the accountability back to public. So, so I'm funded for that. What learning happened? What was your plans? And what were the students? How did you assess them? And how are you communicating that? But the learning actually doesn't happen in the LMS. So it's not a learning management system. It really is a records management system. That's the way I look at the yeah. LMS. I'm stuck in one uh, in Vancouver Island University, Desire to Learn. Great LMS. It's got all kinds of wonderful features and everything else. But we go out in the Google communities. We go out in online. We're in wikis. We're in Weebly sites. We're everywhere. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, I, I leave my students' grades in the university system that frequently crash, and then I take them outside and I use all my own tools. But I teach teachers, and I don't want to teach them, I think it's asinine, I teach you in, a, in Blackboard, and you'll never be able to use Blackboard in your life. Um, I'd rather teach you in a tool that you can use in your classroom. Um, and, and my challenge is always, I would rather, I believe in Creative Commons, I believe in OERs and living openly, primarily because I know my content will stay online as long as I pay my domain. You know, as long as I pay my hosting fees, my content's online. Um, you know, the content always drops down, um, you know, at universities. Um, and I know that uh, if I create a digital identity, my content's online. I don't have to worry about you know, will Ning's go under? Uh, will Ning's change? I won't have to worry about will Google Plus go away? And then, you know, will it become Google Reader? I don't, my, I have classes in there, but I don't worry because I know I sort of back everything else up outside that and build my own space, build my own learning hub. Hey, Verena, do you want to teach that course in Fedora? <laughs> We'll talk later. I got some ideas. Any other questions? Any comments? Concerns? I just think in the interest of time for others that we'd be happy to stick around and answer questions, but maybe at this point in time probably need to wrap it. We're a little past the top of the hour. Yep. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much to our presenters. Um, as Randy just mentioned, they will be around for questions for a few more minutes. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pose those to them uh, in the chat window there. Before we do wrap up, I just wanted to make mention of a couple other ongoing MVLRI initiatives. We have our podcast series called Virtual Viewpoints. We just released another episode yesterday where we chatted with Sarah Lukes out of Next Generation Learning Challenges to talk a little bit about their grant process and some of the exciting work that some of their grant recipients are doing, so we encourage you to click that link there and, and listen to our latest episode. We also have a guest blogger program, so if you're out there interested in writing for us and for our audience on anything to do with K-12 online and blended learning, if you've got some research to highlight, uh, please feel free to click that link there and learn a little bit more about that initiative so you can see exactly what we're looking for out of that program. We do have our Summer Research Collaborative, uh, which is coming up Wednesday, August 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, where we encourage researchers in the field of K-12 online and blended to come together uh, once uh, a quarter. So this will be our summer quarterly collaborative. And uh, we'll be sharing uh, research in progress. We'll be sharing any opportunities for research, uh, general opportunities in, in the research area of K-12 and online and blended. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to email Catherine. Catherine can probably put her email in the chat window there, and she can answer any questions about our collaborative as well. And that'll be held in the same space here in our Adobe Connect room, connect.mivu.org slash mvlri. Thanks, Catherine. In the meantime, if you do have any feedback for us about the webinar process or any of our ongoing initiatives, please feel free to reach out to us. Our email is listed, is listed here. You can sign up for our mailing list by clicking that link there in the second line. 
Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handles are listed as well as our LinkedIn page. And we'll be posting the recording of this webinar uh, on our YouTube channel at MVLRI1. And that's where you can also find the recordings of all of our past webinars and to see uh, a list of all of our upcoming scheduled webinars as well as information about our archived webinars from the past you can check out our mvlri.org website uh, that's mvlri.org slash presentations slash webinars so once again I want to thank our presenters thank you to our attendees for being so participatory um, Thank you for sharing all of your thoughts, especially being an active group in the chat and with, uh, and with the microphones as well. Uh, I think this was a great, very informative session, and uh, I want to thank everyone involved for participating. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I will leave the chat window open for maybe about five or ten more minutes if folks want to wrap up any conversations they're having. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Take care. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, thanks, Justin, Catherine. Great group. Thanks, thanks Catherine. You guys rock.